process of doing uh, when it, before it got uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, but they, they, I think it's clearly that they, they, one of the major challenges of our contemporary moment is this building of a united front. People are talking about you know, all the great work. I mentioned in the session yesterday about labor organizing and how extraordinary it was, but you know, it still set, tends to be stuck in you know, labor kinds of uh, um, organizing. Sorry, I'll get that part this up, thanks. Um, but I think it's just absolutely essential uh, to connect to social movements like you know, Occupy and figure out how to uh, work with movements as well as uh, uh, local. And the other point, which I think is, uh, which Acorn we can probably uh, uh, differ on, the, on, on this one, but I think what the current moment maybe points to is the need for a, for a sharper critical analysis of the, uh, of the contemporary political uh, economy of neoliberalism, which uh, started maybe in 76, 75, certainly through the, uh, through the 80s. Acorn always had a, uh, a radical critique. It was sort of, a lot of it was in, implicit about us against them, and the poor against the, uh, uh, the affluent, the, kind of what uh, Wade uh, referred to, maybe it was Gary too, about a majoritarian strategy of building a majority, which is close to the 99%, but you know, it's uh, more like the 51%. Um, which is probably closer to the truth on some of this. Um, but I think now what we see is the value, and hopefully people will be doing this uh, uh, more in contemporary efforts, um, of uh, putting in an analysis, a critical analysis, of the nature of this kind of neoliberal capitalism that really is the, uh, is the culprit in much of the uh, income inequality and money, the, uh, the problems that our nation and our globe uh, uh, globe faces, and perhaps if Acorn had uh, stuck around longer, they might have uh, been able to, uh, to, to do some of that even more and added that to their radical analysis, but hopefully organizations will do uh, more of it now, building on the, uh, the lessons of, uh, of Acorn. So, thank you for your time. So, well, I'm sort of in the wrong pew. Uh, not being a professional historian by any pretense, uh, but delighted to be here. Glad uh, Professor Chappelle invited me, and of course, old friends. Um, Gary Delgado used to have an expression, Gary was the first organizer ever recruited and actually paid money to at Acorn back uh, in Little Rock. I had to convince him he would live through the experience. And, um, we used to have an expression as we got older and knew each other longer and longer that uh, there was a certain point where you were sort of too old to door knock and too young to die. And uh, finally, after having spent 38 years with ACORN, I left uh, June 2nd of 2008. I'm exactly in that position that I finally no longer laugh at the joke but understand it fully. So the reason I sort of embrace coming to some historians is that uh, having been out of ACORN and now I work with ACORN International in 12 uh, different countries still as a community organizer. I'm still involved in labor organizing and a number of other projects. But spend a lot of time now thinking now that ACORN went out of business uh, November 5th of 2010, sort of what did we do right, what did we do wrong, and not being uh, still being too young to die, what do we have to do to correct this project? One of the reasons I like running into historians is they always take you aside and they sort of, you know, look up to me and they pat me on the shoulder and say, you know, wait, social organizations, social movements don't last 40 years. I actually don't take a lot of comfort from that, uh, but, you know, uh, that's probably uh, still in the grieving process. But it certainly is the case where they looked at the, the antecedents of ACORN as we did in building it, the Nonpartisan League, the People's Alliance, the Populist Party, the great labor struggles. Uh, many of those organizations uh, were, uh, would have been lucky to do 20 years, much less 40 years. So uh, I'm not uh, illiterate to the point. It's important in understanding this topic of community organizing that you can't really fully get your arms around ACORN without understanding that essentially we were a constituency organization. We organized low and moderate income families. We organized the majority. The reason I liked going to Arkansas was that those issues I had organized around in welfare rights as head organizer of Massachusetts welfare rights that were welfare recipient AFDC issues, school lunches, Title I, Go to Arkansas, 70% of the people were eligible 
for those same benefits that I've been getting arrested for in Springfield and Boston as we campaigned on those issues as part of welfare rights. So it was an easy transition to have this notion of another organizing model that would be mass-based across uh, races and statewide organization, membership-based and direct action, et cetera, et cetera, because I could go into ACORN first feeling some comfortability that some of the issues I've known from welfare rights would have resonance even in, in Arkansas. Now, the numbers change, so that, at that point in Arkansas in 1970, $70,000 was the benchmark. 70% of the state made less than $7,000. 30% of the state made over $7,000. Now $7,000 obviously is no money. It still wasn't any money. Um, states like Arkansas and Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, et cetera, always have been at that bottom, but it allowed us to build a very diverse base. But as a constituency organization, we organize communities just like we organize welfare recipients as welfare rights organizations because this was a vehicle that held them, that held their interests, expressed their issues, allowed them to engage and then take action successfully to win. The same reason we started in 1980 organizing on workplace related issues and what finally uh, later became uh, from job based issues, United Labor Unions, and in 1984 we affiliated those unions largely for lack of resources to get to scale, ACORN couldn't afford uh, building full unions to the service employees. Um, and we've been, Fred is, is overly kind of talking about our, our, our uh, putting our foot in the sea of media. Um, we didn't utilize it as well as we should have. We got involved in that largely because of the campaign in 1976 trying to win lifeline rates on the ballot in Little Rock. We won the election, but felt like we were overwhelmed in terms of the opposition's uh, budget, so we started trying to figure out how to access non-commercial radio stations. The uh, questions that, the question I'll look at briefly only because no one else has touched on it, and then my interest is obviously the questions you'll have and what kind of dialectic can, uh, we can get involved in here is, is why, is how state power worked and how power changed from when I started ACORN in 1970 to now, and how it affected the strategy and, and development of the organization. In 1970, you could organize in cities and you could jump over the, the problem of state legislatures. So even uh, in organizing in Arkansas in 1972, as the legislature was passing uh, bills to demand our membership list and accuse it and demand that we sign anti-communist statements, et cetera, et cetera. We could still leverage, you had Wilbur Mills in, in the second district in Arkansas, you had powerful Senate bill, you could jump into the federal bureaucracy even in the Nixon days and move money into cities. Now that changed, changed radically. Uh, not so much in Nixon, not even in Carter, but so certainly in Reagan, where, and then in full flower as devolution to the states, we were in a position where we were a large organization, we were a membership organization, we did have this sort of centralized structure, all the things that you've heard about for better or worse. But we didn't have enough cloud anymore. It wasn't enough to be in Dallas and Houston, or in just in Miami, or in LA and San Francisco and Oakland, and get anything done in state legislatures once devolution moved so much of the money from federal block grants into the state where you had governors and legislatures that you couldn't impact based on the problems of redistricting and, and the shrunken political clout of, of cities. So we were forced in that period, in my view, to have to expand dramatically and, and aggressively. So all of a sudden, if you look at the point I left, there were, you know, 13 offices in California, there were eight offices in Texas, there were seven, eight offices in Florida. You had to be in enough places to get the sort of lift to be able to contend to validly represent your membership. And 